So I urge people to really know what works for your lifestyle and not be so hard on yourself if you can't do some of these things that some experts say are really important or that work for for you, for example, but not for someone else. Hey there, I'm Goli Kalkaran, and this is Lessons from a Quitter, where we believe that it's never too late to start over. No matter how much time or money you've spent getting to where you are, if ultimately you are not happy, then it's time to get out. If you're feeling stuck and you feel like there's got to be more, there's got to be a way to feel fulfilled and excited about what you do, then this is the podcast for you. Each week, I will sit down with an inspiring guest who quit their professional career in order to forge their own path and create a life that they love. Hello. Welcome back. Thank you for joining me. I hope you all are well. I am doing great. I went to a conference last week called Social Media Marketing World in San Diego, and it was an incredible experience. But the reason I wanted to bring it up is because I almost didn't go. And one of my goals for this year was to go to more conferences because I know the power of live events and networking, investing in yourself, being immersed in a topic for a couple of days, being with like-minded people, it's very powerful. And so I really wanted more of that, especially in you know the new space of podcasting that I'm in, as well as marketing for my business. And so I had kind of committed to doing that. But the problem was that every time I would find a conference that I wanted to go to, these self-doubts would pop in. And for me, it looks like you know, it's too expensive. Is it really worth it? Can I learn this stuff online? And the biggest stopper for me is leaving my two young kids to go traveling for a couple of days. I had never left my daughter, who's a year and a half, for the night before. And so I quickly find reasons why it's not worth it to go to these conferences. And this conference was an hour away from my house, so I didn't have to fly, and it was only going to be gone for one night. And I'd known about the conference for months in advance, and yet I'd kind of written it off. And what happened was the week before, I found out that somebody I'd been trying to connect with was going to be at the conference, and I really wanted to meet this person. And I really started sitting with, like, why am I resisting going to this conference that makes so much sense for me? And I realized that a lot of those self-doubts or that inner voice wasn't actually my own fears. I don't really have a qualm leaving my kids for a night. I know they'll be fine. They're in great hands. My husband's an incredible parent. I have a ton of family support around. So it wasn't that I was scared for them or anything. And it wasn't that I didn't think it was worth the money. I mean, all of these things like weren't mine. I realized what it was is like my constant worry about what other people think. And, you know, I have certain family members or friends that may not understand what I'm doing with the podcast and with the business. And I always worry, are they going to think like, what is she doing? Why is she spending this money? Why is she leaving her kids? Like, is this, this isn't really a job and all this and on and on. And, you know, it doesn't come out like that in my head because if that is something easy to be like, oh, I don't care what other people think, but it masks itself and I take on that guilt and it becomes my own thoughts where when I really sat down and evaluated, I realized like it's not my own thoughts and fears. So the reason I bring this up though is this was a good lesson for me because I feel like a lot of times we are waiting for someone to give us permission. Like I want someone to come and tell me, it's okay for you to go to this conference. It's okay for you to invest in yourself. And like, that's not going to come. Like I have to be the one that says, okay, even if other people don't understand, this is worth it for me. And the reason is like, there's also like no instant like return on investment, right? It's not like I'm going to go to this conference and no matter how good it is, it's not going to be like, this was the best conference of my life and it changed everything. And now my company is going to grow so massively. Like that's not going to happen, but it's something that like, it is important to me to invest in myself and do this. And like, why am I allowing other people's thoughts or worries have power over me? And, you know, I've already dealt with other people's thoughts. Like when I left with, when I left the law Um, and when I put myself out with this podcast, but I'm realizing that like it just comes up over again in other ways and it is a constant thing to work on and it's a constant thing to battle. And I consistently have to look at like, what do I want for my life? And even if other people don't understand what that is, like I have to be okay with that. Otherwise, like my life is going to pass me by and I'm not going to do things because I'm so fearful of like not pleasing everybody. Um, 
And so I wanted to raise that because I think it comes up a lot. I think we wait for these perfect moments. We wait for some, you know, maybe we don't realize we're waiting for permission, but we want someone to tell us it's okay to quit or to do this or to make this big change or even to do little things. And I, you know, I'm still guilty of having those same worries and thoughts and letting it affect me. And this was something that kind of, you know, brought it to light for me this week. And it's something I realized I really need to work, you know, when the next conference comes around. I hope that helps you too, you know. Know that you have to decide. You have to make the decision. And you have to take those hard steps to say, like, I am worth it. And I'm going to do what I want to do for my own life. And I will deal with the ramifications. And other people may not be okay with it. And you have to be okay with that. And that is much harder said than done. And with that, I want to jump into this awesome interview that I had with Dr. Zelana Momini. Now, what I had explained in a couple of episodes ago, if you're a regular listener, is in addition to the typical interviews that we do of quitters, people that have quit traditional careers and have gone on to do amazing things, I also want to bring on experts that can help us figure out what our next jump should be, how to fix our mindset, all these other things that you need and if you're thinking about a big jump like this. And we've had some incredible guests in the past, like Dr. Aziz Gazipura. We just had Montine Blank talk about, you know, who needs a life coach. And today we have the pleasure of having Dr. Zelana on the podcast. And the reason I really wanted her on is because she calls herself a reformed happiness researcher. And what she has found in her research is that, you know, this constant pursuit of happiness is what is making everybody unhappy. And instead of just focusing on happiness, we should be working on building resilience. And I think that that is such an interesting and important discussion to have. And I really thought that it is pertinent to people that find themselves unhappy in their careers and what we should, how we should be reframing it, what we should be thinking about when we're thinking about jumping. So let me tell you a little bit about the amazing Dr. Zelana. She is the best-selling author of 21 Days to Resilience. She is a prominent figure in positive psychology and one of Maria Shriver's Architects of Change. Dr. Zelana is a renowned wellness architect, and she helps people build resilience in order to lead more fulfilling and content lives. She is a leading authority and a go-to speaker in the media. You will see her on Access Live, The Today Show, Good Morning America, and on and on. She regularly contributes to publications like Health Magazine, Better Homes and Gardens, and again, the list goes on. She's clearly very accomplished, and you know I'm hoping that she can help us figure out like why we shouldn't be pursuing happiness, but instead trying to build our resilience and how that can help us lead a more fulfilled life. So without further ado, let's jump in and talk to Dr. Zelana. Hi, Dr. Zelana. Thank you so much for joining me. It's a pleasure to be here. I am so excited to get into all the incredible stuff from your book and how we can all kind of build our resilience. But before we do that, can you tell us a little bit about your background and what you do? Sure. So I am a clinical psychologist. I have a doctorate in psychology and also certifications in nutrition. And what I sort of call myself is a reformed happiness researcher (laughs) in the sense that, you know, I started out researching happiness and how it relates to positive outcomes. And along the way, you know, it became disenchanted with, I guess, our definition of happiness and people's obsession with it Mm -hmm. and realized that the more we aspire to be happy, the less happy we are. That led me to research truly successful, content people and find that resilience was really the core trait that they possessed and not happiness. That's what I do today. So I focus on building people's strengths and essentially call myself a resilience coach. Okay. And so kind of going back to that, I agree with you. We're focusing on happiness and it does seem like people are more unhappy than ever. So tell me like what you found out as you were doing this research. I think the media caught on to the happiness craze early on. And of course, everybody wants to feel happy because it triggers the reward motivation system in our brain. So it makes us always wanting more but it's never truly fulfilling. And if you anchor your goals in a fleeting feeling like happiness, it sets us up for failure. You know, I've really found that the more people aspire to be happy, the more things they have on their to-do list, like journaling and whatnot that they can't get to, 
realistically day to day, the less happy they are because they feel like failures, that they can't actually get to these things, that they have time constraints that don't allow them to do all the tools that they need to be to be happy rather than just focusing on the cycle of happiness, which rises and falls like every other feeling throughout the day. And so what do you mean when you are saying now that you focus on resilience? You know, I think we typically think of resilience as like being able to, I guess, bounce back. But how would you define resilience? Yeah, and I love that you said that because it is often thought of bouncing back. The reality, though, is that, you know, resilient people who are actually thriving don't just bounce back. A lot of people do bounce back and they think they're resilient, but that's not what it means. Because to be resilient, you ultimately have to thrive, right? So you can't bounce back. A lot of people just get through something and they're like, oh, I'm really resilient. But that's not it. What resilient people do really well is they experience post-traumatic growth instead Mm -hmm. of post-traumatic stress. So they're able to take their pain and their challenges and the daily grind and learn something from it and grow and strengthen. On this podcast, we do talk a lot with people that, you know, were unhappy in their careers and they decided to make a change. And I actually think the typical person that I talk to that's miserable in their career, unhappy, they say some form of, you know, you can't always be happy or that's not real life. This is what it is. And this is work. And I have a feeling like that's not what we're talking about when we're talking about resilience. Like, how do you know when it's a time to kind of be able to like deal with the issues in your life and kind of push forward? And how do you know when it's like, okay, there really needs to be a change because this is affecting my mental state in you know more ways than just trying to always be happy? I think that it's an important distinction to make. I think if you're in a situation where you're being impacted really consistently for more than, you know, a few weeks, where your quality of life is really diminished by whatever situation you're in, whether it's a job situation or a marriage or, you know, something that really is impacting your well being consistently. And I'm not just talking about, you know, feeling sad or depressed or angry about it, but also, you know, physically impacted, it's just really debilitating, then it's definitely something that needs to be looked at and changed and find a solution to. I think in terms of the daily grind and the ups and downs, sort of the vicissitudes of life that are fairly normal, I think we have a knee-jerk reaction not to be as accepting of those things just because in our culture we're trained to, you know, really want quick fixes and everything to be great and feel good, you know, so when we experience any kind of negativity, we just sort of say, oh, gosh, like, right away, we have to change things. And that's not always the case. A lot of things require work, or to look at a challenge as an opportunity to find something that you can grow and strengthen from within that. So I think it's important to know yourself and to know your lifestyle. And when something really is impacting you on a deep level, um, to have the self awareness it requires to assess the situation, make changes moving forward. And I talk through a lot of this in my book as well. Yeah, I was going to bring up your book. I think that so your book, 21 Days to Resilience, is a fantastic one, and it provides a lot of actionable steps. You know, I think everybody should read it because I do think there's a lot of work to be done, and this isn't something that just kind of happens overnight. But are there some things that people could start doing to help build their resilience? Like today, you know, is there like some homework people could start? Yeah, you know, I built the book into 21 different days because it takes around that on average to create a new habit. And resilience really is a skill that we have to learn and train ourselves to become. It's not something we're born with or without. So the point of the book is to be a real sort of toolkit and guide on how to actually integrate these skills within your world. And each skill set is sort of within the realm of resilience. So for example, I talk about gratitude, I talk about the importance of realistic optimism, and not just positivity all the time. I talk about altruism and flexibility and all of these important things. I also talk about humor. So I think, for example, and it's important to tackle sort of all of those facets, because my research shows all of them are required to be resilient. So it's really hard to sort of summarize in a call or a sentence right, or right. a podcast. But I would say that I think one of the biggest precursors to resilience is that that resilient people are really accepting of themselves and their circumstances. They're not sort of resistant to change. They're flexible. They're able to pivot. And they're highly emotionally intelligent and aware of themselves. 
And those are all things that if they sound sort of far reaching to you, like, oh, that's not (laughs) me, you know, those are all things that you can become. You have the power to become if you train yourself. Many of us just don't get that training. We don't get it from schools, unfortunately. Many of us don't get it from our home environment. So what's really neat as a researcher is that we can change that for ourselves if we put in the time and the energy. And that's really what the book is. But little things like gratitude, for example, it is important. And a lot of the research shows that resilient people are grateful um, for their circumstances and their successes and their failures. Right. So I would say, you know, a quick tip and tool is when you do approach a failure or a challenge to flip that lens and be really grateful for it triggers your brain to look at it more objectively and less emotionally and then say, oh, okay, and let, let me find the learnings in this. Let me see, what did I do that surprised me? What happened that didn't surprise me? What did I expect? You know, mm-hmm. who should I have asked for help? You know, and really approach it more as a project than something that's about your ego. Right. And I love what you just said. I mean, the gratitude thing, I had an episode that I did about how, honestly, gratitude practice changed my life. And I really do think that is something I always thought I was a super grateful person, but there is just this power in doing like, even if it's a simple thing of saying it out loud, you know, every night and just shifting your perspective and looking at how many things go right in your day, as opposed to just like everything that's going wrong. And it kind of, it just lifts your mood. So I love that you mentioned that one, but what you just said earlier too, that we talk a lot about on this podcast, I think that we all realize that like exercise is something you have to constantly do. Like you're not going to do it once or you're not going to all of a sudden become fit and it's going to stay that way forever. It's a constant like part of your lifestyle. And I think we're just getting around to people realizing that they need to do a lot more work internally or like with mental health. I think before it was always like go to a therapist if you have certain like very extreme problems or whatnot. And I love that what you were saying with this habit. So I mean, it's just stuff that it's not going to happen quickly and it's going to continue. You need to practice it constantly. But like everything else, I mean, the biggest thing, if you can help control your mind or, you know, slow down all of these like negative biases that we have, like I've seen the biggest impact in my life from that work. Right. I think that's important. You know, I do want to say that it's important to know yourself and what you're capable of. I think that a lot of these practices make some people really stressed out and they don't have the bandwidth necessarily to, you know, a single mom of five kids, like might not have time to pause and, you know, do journaling or meditate or do, you know, whatever. So I urge people to really know what works for your lifestyle and not be so hard on yourself if you can't do some of these things that some experts say are really important or that work for for you, for example, but not for someone else. You know, I did a talk yesterday and someone mentioned that journaling just doesn't work for them and how should they go about that? And I said, just don't do it. <laughs> like You don't have to journal right. to be resilient or happy, frankly. Right. Do what works for you and your lifestyle. And if you can't get to it, then just leave it off your list. Now, certainly there are things that are critical that you should integrate into your life. And I would, you know, really urge people to dissect like what that is and how to fit it in. Calendar things literally into your schedule so that you block time out for yourself, you know, for the things that matter to you. And you're right. People put so much energy into their, you know, the way they look, their nutrition, going to the gym, right? But then they neglect their mental health and and expect to thrive. And it just doesn't work that way. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I think that uh, learning to kind of with anything, you know, you're saying, again, like with exercise, every type of exercise isn't for everyone. You know, maybe I don't like running and I like doing something else like yoga and someone else likes more high. I think it's the same, you know, like you're definitely drawn to different forms of mental health and and, um, mindfulness. And as long as you kind of search for it and try to incorporate what you can, then I think that's kind of important. I loved in your book, you know, there's obviously 21 different tips and aspects to resilience, but one that kind of struck out to me, and I think that comes up again with the topic that we talk about is control. Because you talk a lot about it like this learned helplessness where people act as if like things are happening to them. And it just really struck a chord because somebody had recently on the podcast talked about lawyers or a lot of people that are miserable in their careers as caged birds with the door open because a lot of times we feel stuck in something that you're not actually stuck in. Like it's difficult, you know, it might be scary, but you can leave. Yet so many of us, I mean, myself included, when I was working as a lawyer, I literally felt like I couldn't leave. And so it's an interesting thing. Like 
how do people kind of make that shift of understanding? You know, sometimes I think a lot of these self-help gurus and everybody wants to talk about like everything is in your control. And I think people kind of push back against that because obviously there's life circumstances and everyone's circumstances are different. Totally. Not everything is in your control. Absolutely. And I think the sooner we understand what we do have control over, the quicker we can make changes. What we certainly do have control over is our perspective and our perception. And if there's one thing that I've learned through this research journey that I'm on is that our perception of of our world changes everything because what we believe becomes our truth. And so if you're able to train yourself to perceive of a situation from a different lens, you're able to change your world. And so that doesn't mean like magically, you know, a single dad with three girls is going to like dream up a perfect wife. But do you know what I'm saying? Like it has to be realistic. But he could be more grateful for the gift of having girls and perhaps join a group of single dads where he meets his next, you know, best friend and group of buddies, and they all, you know, create connections that last a lifetime. Like, so there's different ways to approach trauma. And I think that people need to understand that. And I love that you're saying that it's very timely, because I was just speaking to my six year old son about this. And the example that I gave him because he said, it's your fault that I'm angry. (laughs) <laughs> and that really struck a chord with me. And I said to him, and I say this to my clients too, if a person trips on a rock, is it the rock's fault or the person's fault? <laughs> and my son was adamant that it was the rock's <laughs> fault. And it was so amazing to talk through it with him and see how his mind started to make those critical connections where he realized that it can't be the rock's fault, right? right? right. And what it takes to shift you know, a perspective, it's not easy. But once you do, it's pretty miraculous. That's an that's a, a great analogy. I hadn't thought of it like that. But you're absolutely right. And I think that brings up actually a good point, which isn't like super related to what we talk about here. But I have seen it come up so many times with the people that I've talked to. How do we teach that kind of resilience to our kids? I think you were talking about in a culture that's obsessed with happiness. I think that's even more so with like parenting, like we're all so terrified of our children like being unhappy and god forbid like you know something happens look we're, we are kind of in this helicopter parenting phase and so i know as a mother of two i'm constantly trying to walk that line of like letting them experience life and build that resilience and then wanting to like fix everything for them so like counsel people and like how to help build that resilience for children so that they can be successful in their lives yeah i do and i do a lot of seminars on this topic as well as I'm pretty passionate about getting resilience curriculum into schools because it has to be taught. But I think it's sad what's happened to our children because of our best intentions. But we've really created a super fragile generation um, who's plagued by a variety of mental health issues. You know, I hate to be the person like blaming parents. I mean, I'm a parent too as well. But I do think that our parenting style and our inability to, you know, generally allow our children the space to make mistakes is really handicapping them. So I would say the one, if there was like one thing I could condense all of my seminars (laughs) into, it's that we need to get comfortable with our children's discomfort very quickly. Because if we don't, you know, we're paving the path for the child and not preparing the child for the path. And now we're seeing the consequences that that has with our suicide rates through the roof and all of the myriad of other issues that have, you know, started coming out in these younger generations. Yeah, no, I know. It's really scary to watch. And, you know, as I'm conscious of these, I feel like we've so been trained to kind of now hover over our children that it's such a hard habit to break. Yeah, it's really hard. But you know, we can break habits. And I talk a lot about this in my book, I actually have an article out in mind body green today, just today about the difference between habits and goals, and how important it is that we know the difference. And habits can be broken. I talk about how to break them in my book, how to replace cues and rewards. We have to do it very quickly because our children are suffering. And I see it every single day. And you know, the reality is when we fix things for our kids, when we problem solve for them, when we email the teacher instead of making them talk to the teacher about their issues, when we bring their lunch to school because they forgot it, when we do their homework for them because we can't stand if they get a C versus an A, we are essentially telling them that they are not capable. So it's much more than just like not letting them fail. It's actually shaping their confidence and self-worth. And that's just a long-term, very deep 
thing that just is so hard to rebuild later in life. Yeah, absolutely. And again, it's so funny because I can understand that and it makes, and you're absolutely right, and it makes perfect sense. Yet in practice, it's so difficult to take that step back and watch that go down. I know. I know. (laughs) It is heart-wrenching. I mean, my son did his homework last night and got, you know, probably four words misspelled. He misspelled four words and it took every (laughs) like bone in my body to not react to it and let him deal with his teachers, right? his own mistakes. Like I, it was so easy for me to just say, Oh, wait, is that how you spell truck? Right. But it's right. like, but then what is he going to learn? No, absolutely. I mean, you're hundred percent right. And I think, you know, kind of bringing that back to even what people go through in these careers that I see or myself, like what I went through, I actually, you know, didn't have parents that helicoptered at all. But what I did have is when you're on this path and you're good at the path that's laid out and you never fail and you just are constantly like you get good grades and you keep going along, this like immense fear of failure, it's what keeps you in a place that you're unhappy in because you're not used to like basically being able to take that fail, that L and, and do something else. Like it's there's so many people that I see in these careers that have just been so good at climbing whatever ladder they need to climb that even if they hate the wall that it's against, they just keep climbing it because the idea of failing at something is so terrifying. Yeah, I think that's a huge other myth in our culture that we've been sort of like when our kids fail, we're so much more accepting when they're little babies, like when they're learning how to walk or when they're, you know, making their first words, like we encourage them, we're joyful, we have smiles on our faces, we don't approach it with fear. And something that happens, like when we start to grow, that smiles turn into frowns and the failure becomes very personal. And really, it's not. And so when we're able to approach our failures almost like a detective and separate the negative feelings from it and then really dissect it as an opportunity for growth, amazing things can happen. Yeah. You're absolutely right. I'm learning that lesson kind of later in life, but I'm glad I'm learning it because it does open you up to so many more things that you can do when you let go of some of that fear of trying to be perfect. Well, the perfectionism is a whole other, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) Yeah, that I'm learning as well. Yeah, okay. So like, just to wrap up, I mean, what advice would you give? Let's talk about people that are in a job. They don't know if, you know, maybe the career is not for them. Maybe the job is not for them. A lot of times people feel very stuck is like, do I try to upend everything and like quit what I've done for my, or is it just because I'm unhappy, you know, in this certain situation? Like how can people kind of gain clarity what they truly want? I think that's a tough one because we have such a knee jerk reaction in our culture to be unhappy with like the slightest discomfort Mm -hmm. that it's really important to give it time, give things time to breathe and know yourself. I would say take time away from the situation if you can to gain some perspective, do something totally different, throw your life outside of habit and ritual and do something really different to be able to come back to the situation with a fresh lens with a little bit of a reboot. If you can take a day, great. If you can take two, even better. It could even be like a couple hours where you just go for a hike and just come back to your office desk and, you know, renewed. But take some time away and really challenge yourself not to think about your current challenge. Think about totally different things to let your brain rest. Then come back to it. And if you're still feeling the same way, yes, definitely reassess your circumstances and figure out what needs to be changed. But I would urge people to not have sort of like a knee-jerk reaction about the negative. Good advice. I hadn't really thought of that. I guess we just want to sometimes put a Band-Aid on it or just change it quickly without looking at exactly what the underlying problem might be. Right. Well, this has been super helpful. Thank you so much, Dr. Zilana. Uh, Where can people find you if they want to maybe get more of your work or reach out? Yeah, well, my book is sold wherever books, you know, are sold on Amazon or any bookstores, um, 21 Days to Resilience. And then you can always contact me through my website, which is drzelana.com. So D-R-Z-E-L-A-N-A.com. I'm also on socials and on Instagram at dr.zelana. So D-R.Z-E-L-A-N-A. Wonderful. I will link to all of those in the show notes in case people can't write it down right now. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you coming on the show. Yeah. Thank you so much for the great question. Happy to be here. How awesome is Dr. Zelana? 
You should definitely pick up her book, 21 Days to Resilience. It has so much good actionable advice that obviously we couldn't get to in a short interview. But here are my three takeaways. One, happiness is not the end-all, be-all goal of our life. So if you find yourself in discomfort or unhappiness, sit with it for a minute. See what the source of it is, what you can change and what you can't, and what you can handle and what you can't. If it ultimately becomes something that affects you on a physical level or it isn't something that goes away, then make a change. But we got to stop this knee-jerk reaction. Two, just like everything else with mindfulness and mindset, figure out what works for you. If you hate going to the gym, making a goal to go every morning at 6 a.m. to the gym is probably not going to last. Same thing with mindfulness. Figure out whether it's journaling or gratitude practice or going on a hike or whatever it is that can get you in a better mindset and stick with that. And three, as with all of this stuff, mindset, mindfulness, resilience, it's a habit. It takes time and it's something that needs to be incorporated every day. It won't happen overnight and it builds upon itself. So figure out what works for you, be patient and keep doing it. And with that, I will see you on the next episode of Lessons from a Quitter. Thank you so much for listening. I can't tell you how much it means to me. If you liked the podcast, please rate and review us on iTunes. It'll help other people find the show. If you want to connect or reach out, follow along on Instagram and Facebook at Lessons from a Quitter and on Twitter at Quitter Podcast. I would love to hear from you guys. And I'll see you on the next episode.